So all I was saying was I'm very happy to be here. Thanks again for the opportunity. I have spoken to some of you in various fora in the past. And I think, you know, all of this is coming together quite nicely at around the same time. We had the strategy for data earlier in February, and we launched our open data campaign in April of this year, which I think aligns really well to where the commission has seen some of the opportunities in this space and some of the outputs that we expect to see over the coming months and even coming years. Uh, Microsoft has gone through an interesting journey with all things data. Uh, I know many people are familiar with the company and perhaps many of our products and services, but just the extent to which our involvement with all things data and the way that that's governed, the way that that's made available, I think we've really kind of come to the conclusion that in the future, the most successful companies are going to be those that are most open and most collaborative. We're talking about things like artificial intelligence in particular and the massive amounts of data that are necessary to inform those algorithms, to power some of those outcomes. It's really unlikely that any one entity on their own has enough data to be successful at AI. So we're going to have to work together. Uh, we're going to have to make that possible both with policy and with technology and even with mindset shifts. So I think we were really excited to launch earlier this year our open data campaign, which was uh, formally launched in April. Uh, that includes a number of commitments from Microsoft. Um, all of this is aimed at addressing what we believe is we refer to often as this data divide. As AI becomes more prominent and more important in all of our lives, you know, there are some with a bit more of a head start than others, whether those are companies, whether those are countries. And before data is concentrated only in the hands of a handful of companies or a handful of countries, you know, we want to make sure that the value that can come from that and the outcomes that can come from that are as democratized as possible. And data sharing is one of the key ways of getting there, making these technologies available, uh, shifting some of those mindsets, leading by example. And one of the things we'll be doing to lead by example is we've committed to standing up 20 data collaborations by 2022. These will be projects where Microsoft is involved from a number of angles potentially, but really driven with partners in the research community, uh, sometimes in the, in the corporate community, the policymaker community, to work around data collaborations that address societal challenges, be that sustainability, uh, COVID-19 crisis that comes to mind immediately, of course, we have a few that we've been involved in already in that space, but really showing how projects can be improved and outcomes can be improved when different players are involved, working together, and all the outcomes and results from this would be open by default. So the data sets that can emerge, the learnings that can emerge will be made available for others to reuse and learn from and combine for their projects and the like. So we'll be expecting to make several new announcements in that space as we get to 20 such collaborations by 2022. Uh, already excited about a few that have taken place this year. I think the data sharing opportunity, you know, we call it our open data campaign. I'll, I'll be mostly referring today to data sharing rather than open data. Um, I think this really applies to a variety of scenarios. This is not just a call for companies and everyone to make all of their data open by default for anyone to use in any way they wish. Uh, that wouldn't be appropriate for a number of reasons, but the commission had a principle, uh, both in its strategy for data and, and in previous uh, work, particularly in the research side of things, where you want this to be as open as possible and as closed as necessary. So the different scenarios that would come up there, there can be some, and Microsoft will be contributing this way as well. We'll be opening up data sets for public use, making those available to researchers and communities to learn from, to tap into and combine with other data to come up with new uses and different learnings. Um, and there will also be scenarios where it's between two competitors, potentially, who are working on a private project that they may have been reluctant to share data with each other previously for competition concerns, uh, IP, trade secret concerns. I think we're really excited about some of the technologies that have emerged that can help mitigate some of the risks and reservations that companies have by around sharing data. So we use the example of you know startups who often get excited about a new project or idea and they're identified data sources and everyone's really excited about the project and then the lawyers get involved and things really slow down because it's unclear whether you're allowed to share that data it's unclear what for what purposes you can use it sometimes the the owner of the data is unclear there are privacy concerns naturally that come up um, technology is not a, a panacea for all of this it's not a silver bullet but I do think there are some exciting trends and developments there and products and services that are at least helping mitigate 
and address some of the reservations entities would have around sharing data, whether that's, I can't do it because of privacy, I can't do it because of IP, I can't do it because it'll make my competitors more successful than me, um, I can't do it because I don't know how. Um, some of those questions I think can be addressed, yes, through technology and through policies. So our campaign is structured around several principles that will underpin these collaborations. We'll be contributing both with the collaborations that I mentioned earlier as examples of where this can really be used to address societal uh, outcomes. And we'll also be contributing updates to, of course, the technology tools and the like, and also hopefully feeding into relevant policy discussions and contributing some of our legal work as we've done in the past. Um, and I'm specifically referring to some of the template data sharing agreements that we made available for certain data sharing scenarios that hopefully, um, based on the feedback we gathered from developer communities and the like, you know, give some of those players who may be excited to uh, improve data access, improve data sharing, a little bit more legal certainty that what they're doing is, is going to be okay. Um, I think we would support measures in that space from policymakers you know, writ large. Um, so there's a lot that we'll be contributing. I think there's a lot that we're excited about and uh, anxious to address any questions today or talk more specifically about particular policies or particular concerns um, that folks may have. Um, I'll stop there for now, Eileen, and really want to make it conversational. So you let me know what I can share that's of most interest and anything that I can expand on. I think maybe a question from my side. Um, you mentioned some of those um, data sharing initiatives, a couple of them. Could you maybe go into depth and explain one of them as an example? Sure. Um, one of the most recent ones, I think, that comes to mind. Well, why don't we start from where what's top of mind for so many people if we think about the uh, COVID-19 pandemic. You know, Microsoft uh, earlier this year was a partner with the Alan Turing Institute and the Greater London Authority um, the London Data Commission to demonstrate some of the value of data sharing to help support London's response and recovery to COVID-19. This was an example of leveraging technology and data that was largely in the public sector's uh, side of the house to access some of the sensors that are all around the city to use some of that sensor data around traffic and movement to identify you know, where people, how are people moving now where are they where are they gathering where are they going and how can this be informed how can this help inform part of london's response to uh the the crisis both in terms of new measures that prove effective measures that maybe are perhaps less effective you know can we learn anything from transport for london about the sensor data that we're gathering and the policy making decisions around future measures that may need to be taken, you know, where concentrations of infections can occur, where people are gravitating towards. Um, I think we're really excited about that. Uh, in that context as well, we teamed up earlier this year with some partners in the US. Uh, Adaptive Technologies was one of the companies to really use the data that um, they had and some of the cloud computing tools in our possession to do a better job of trying to track the immune, immune response to the virus learning from that and identifying are there other are connections here, are there patterns that we're seeing in some of these infections? Can we contribute that data to the healthcare professionals and policymakers who are making decisions around that? I think there's a lot of exciting things that can be done in the health space, but it's a really good example of where there's a lot of excitement for the outcomes uh, because those can touch people very directly with you know, livelihoods and the like, but we are talking about some of the most sensitive data uh, you can imagine. So the controls and the restrictions that are in place there are normally quite appropriate. Um, so we want to get that opportunity, but also respect all of the concerns that people naturally would have when we're talking about access to personal data. And then more recently as well, just to pivot to another topic, uh, we partnered with Allianz, Amazon, and S&P Global to announce the Climate Finance Foundation, uh, which was led by the Linux Foundation. So given all of the attention, of course, understandable around climate change and challenges linked to that in the 21st century, you know, this is something that hopefully is part of the solution. The idea here is to create an open source data platform, if you will, that'll help inform decision-making in the business community around corporate sustainability and enabling that community to make more informed decisions based on more accurate and reliable economic models around corporate climate related risk and opportunities. So we've invested heavily in sustainability at Microsoft in ways that we can improve uh, our carbon 
footprint and for companies that are looking to do so as well, this should provide a platform of sorts with more real data that can be tapped into and analyzed to help inform some of those business investment decisions uh, for companies that are looking to meet their climate obligations. Uh, those are just a few. We'll be announcing more in the coming months, um, but happy to talk a little bit more about that or any others. I think we're also really excited um, around connectivity and con contributions that we can make uh, for broadband access. Uh, once again, looking at you know where are communities uh, less served at the moment, you know what type of data can we bring to policymakers that are making some of those investment decisions and showing the importance of it. Um, I could go on and on. I, I think scaling is another example of where post crisis we will be seeing. Unfortunately, a lot of displaced workers. Um, how can we help policymakers who are making investments in training and curricula programs for the next generation of skills and jobs? You know, I think if you look at the combination of the work done with LinkedIn and the World Bank, you know, providing some of this data in an aggregate form to show which skills and which jobs are most in demand and where regions have a lack thereof or a surplus thereof to better inform policymaking around that. So expect some more announcements from us in the coming months, um, cross-cutting many different topics. I think the current crisis is one that is naturally top of mind and for which data can provide a lot more informed decision-making, um, but it goes much, much beyond just the current crisis. This is something that would have applicability to a number of policy areas. And we really wanna make sure these collaborations, one of their goals is to focus on societal ch challenges. Uh, these are not very, very narrow sectoral specific collaboration goals, but rather some of the bigger challenges affecting us all. And again, I think it's important to mention that the outcomes of this and the data sets that emerge will be open by default. Thank you for that. Gianfranco, I saw that you have a question. Yeah, the, as a technologist by trade and, uh, and a consultant today, one of the topics that interests me the more is the cultural change in organizations and Microsoft is very interesting to me and and, and i've been uh, watching you closely particularly over the last few years in how you became a strong uh, backer of open technology from open source uh, to open data and data sharing now and and again I, I'll, I'll zing you for a second there because we, we, if you look back at your at the history of the company we can't say the same so we in 2001 uh, steve balmer said something like that linux was a cancer uh, that attaches itself to intellectual property or something like that. Uh, it's amazing how this changed. And um, I'm curious to know if you have a perspective on how this happened and how you help your colleagues to, um, to, to say, to marry this idea of openness in everything they do at work, I guess, particularly for the ones perhaps my generation that may have developed their understanding of technology in a more closed part of history. What, what do you think about this? No, I think you've I think you've identified it correctly. I think if you think back to some of the quotes from former CEOs, uh, it would be shocking to see where Microsoft is now and some of the projects that we're engaged in, um, some of the different tools that we've been making available in the communities that we're more tapped into now. Some of that, I mean, let, let's be honest about it. it. It's not just a, a mindset, but it, these are some market realities that products and services that are released are more often than not going to be better when you've had more eyes and ears and minds developing that and contributing to that. Uh, if it's just a handful of our engineers that write some code and release a product uh, with that code, I don't think that's going to be as good as a product that had different perspectives and different contributions from people even potentially outside of Microsoft. So you've seen the market take that direction. I think you can even look at Look at the way that Windows was largely uh, done within Microsoft. You know, here's something where source code was understandably um, secret, right? Uh, we don't make that available for just anybody to improve. Uh, different companies took a different approach with that, uh, particularly in the open source side of things. And you start to see market realities where some of those solutions were better than the ones we were putting out there. So you can either take the view that, well, we just need to force our engineers to get better and we stay in a closed approach, get more talent there and try to compete with what others are doing, or you make this more open. You make it possible for more contributors to come in. And you know, people worry about monetization in that 
context, but I don't think the market has shown that that's such a big fear anymore. You know, many of these companies that have taken more open approaches have been very successful. Uh, if you think of some of the products and applications that we're all using today, you know, these are not always a, coming from very closed ecosystems anymore. Uh, their better products and services are those that are continually developing, continually changing, continually being improved with new data and new contributions. One of the stories that I told earlier today in, a, in another event is if you think of, uh, Gianfranco, you may remember this, I certainly remember it, but Microsoft had a, uh, we used to release an Encarta encyclopedia CD-ROM for some time, right? So Microsoft would compile all of this encyclopedic data, put it into a nice digestible format on a CD-ROM. You would put that in your computer, look up whatever you need. And a few years later, we would update it with updated data and we release it again and sell it again. And then Wikipedia came along and people could contribute on the spot in real time to tweak and enhance and add and improve. Well, why are you gonna wait for Microsoft's next CD-ROM when you can get that same information in a much, much more collaborative space and, and actually a much more price friendly point as well. Um, that shows you just where demand forces companies, I think, like ours to move. I'd also highlight it really in the cloud context, uh, the importance of developers to so many of these tools. I think people need to remember that, you know, a lot of Microsoft's business comes from making tools available to other companies, other developers to, to come up with their own products and services. You know, we really at our core are, are providing a toolbox for players to use, to improve their own systems, their own data sets. And you want to make sure you're providing things that people want. And a lot of folks in the developer community and others, you know, they want to code in the languages they're most familiar with. They want to code with the tools that they're most comfortable with. Um, you can try to launch a business by telling them they're all wrong and that's not a good way to do it. Uh, I think it would be more successful to give people what they say they want. Uh, go across the board with that. There'll be different scenarios where some of these tools are more appropriate than others. But I think if you look at where the cloud provides an opportunity and that remote computing possibility, you want to gather as many users as possible. So you go where the demand is. And I think our experience has been the projects that we're working on that have the most amounts of collaboration. Those are the ones that are going to be most successful. And there is a very single point you made that I believe actually is key to the whole line of thought. That is, it was not just a matter of mindset. You simply looked at the market and sometimes the open product was simply better or more uh, suitable to answer a certain kind of need. Okay. And uh, it's inevitable to see the parallel with open data and data sharing. So it took 20 years about for open source software to be considered normal. So nobody, today, nobody would, I would have, someone may still, but nobody would argue that I would not trust uh, Linux to run my defibrillator machine or an embedded system like that. Uh, but open data today still has a bit of a, a reputation problem. Let's say sometimes we uh, we struggle to get good quality out. Uh, sometimes data is incomplete and so on. Um, can you give me some some hope or that the fact that we'll get out uh, of this uh, in less than twenty years for the next round with data sharing and open data? I think so. Um, you know, one of the examples that I like to use from some of our customer segments is if you think about competitor reluctance to make proprietary data more open or more available. And again, this comes back to a point I made earlier about the different scenarios we're talking about. We're not just talking about a scenario where all the data in my possession, I'm gonna put it in a publicly available repository for anybody to do anything with. There may be some cases where that is super suitable and helpful, but if you think about it in a manufacturing context, uh, manufacturers are often located near a water reservoir. They do that because of the water cooling needs for their assembly lines and the like. So they need to tap into the reservoir for water uh, consumption and inputs. And they also then release uh, water back into the reservoir with, in the form of waste and the like. You often have these companies uh, that are competing with each other, normally conglomerated around the same water reservoir. I don't think that one manufacturing company would want to share all of its assembly line data and cooling need data with another because that could potentially divulge trade secrets and vulnerabilities, right? You don't want your competitor knowing you know, how much cooling needs you may have and what your out outputs are. But with the possibility of platforms in that space that both companies could potentially contribute such raw data to, and the only thing the competitors would see are the outputs from that in an aggregate form that may lead to conclusions along the lines of, huh, you know, you may be able to use their outputs for your inputs, 
based on what we've learned from crunching the numbers here, all of a sudden there's a, a wake up moment where you're not divulging anything anymore. Um, we're finding ourselves in a bit more of a win-win situation. And that's only possible because of technology. And it's only possible because of that mindset shift that does kind of have to happen to say, all right, I do feel comfortable putting this here because I see a benefit coming back to me. And that's in a very, very uh, competitor industry context. If you think about it more society, in, in terms of society, there can be a number of uh, examples in a health context. You know, if we look at polling there, I think patients and around the world are, are often very eager to contribute some of their data to new research and new um, trials and the like. But we're talking about some very, very serious data sets. So there's, of course, reservations about you know, what's it going to be used for, who's going to tap into it. Um, again, technology can help mitigate some of that, but when you can see, hopefully, the outputs of such research projects really driving uh, positive health outcomes, improvements, whether it's cures and vaccines and the like, you know, I think you help with some of that mindset shift. Um, and again, I think coming back to the market, you know, I, I think we've been doing much better with this open approach. I think other companies are taking a more open approach and collaborating with partners, whether competitors or others, where you have these win-win scenarios. Um, there's still going to be reluctance and not every scenario is going to fit perfectly into this space. And it's not going to happen overnight. It's not going to happen by next year. Um, but leading by example, I think is part of our contribution to that space and pointing to some of the case studies where players have pivoted a bit and realized, wow, you know, I made that data available to this partner or that partner and it wasn't the end of the world. I actually am still doing well successfully and I feel better now about getting access to other data. That's part of the answer. Yeah. Thank you. I see a question from Els in the chat. Um, where can we find your announcements on new open data sets you share? Sorry if you already said it, I missed the start of the presentation. No, I, I can pop a link into the chat box here for everyone to take a look at. Um, we have a microsite the, developed for our open data campaign, so you can see all of our most recent announcements there, uh, links to further information, uh, all of the things that we're doing in this open data campaign space. So that'll include collaboration announcements where you can find more information. It'll include some of the uh, blogs, of course, that we've written on this. And it'll also include some of those, one of the things we did earlier last year was made available uh, data sharing agreement templates uh, for a number of scenarios that we'll hopefully be adding to. So you can find some of that information there as well. I'll put a link into the uh, chat box. Uh, right away. That'd be great, thank you. The point on data sharing agreements is, is quite interesting because we 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 are working on that literally for, for the commission and we had the opportunity to interview also competitors of yours that are oddly enough finding themselves dealing with exactly the same problem. Uh, I you will know about IBM works, for example, in this space that we had the opportunity to interview about one year ago. And also they developed their own uh, suggested uh, terms for data sharing. Why would you say it is it has to be so complicated. So wh why do we need companies to come out with uh, suggested uh, data sharing terms? Uh, and uh, is there is some, some degree of fragmentation of confusion? What, what, what's your opinion? We see some, and it really, you know, at Microsoft, we are um, sometimes a little bit spoiled for resources. We have a lot of lawyers working at Microsoft. Um, if you are a startup um, with a new idea, that may depend upon the use of data in the possession of whether it's public authorities or another startup that you're excited about a particular collaborative project on, you know, you're not going to have necessarily that legal expertise and, you know, you get excited about the possibilities, you get excited about where the project's going and where, you know, where you can take it. And then you ask for some legal advice and everything slows down because they say, well, wait a second. Um, there are some privacy, is there personal data there? Um, are you clear on who the IP owner may be in this context? Oh, wait, you're doing a cross-border project? I'm not familiar with the laws in that other uh, country, and that may just even be within Europe. Um, so with legal teams in companies like Microsoft, you know, we may have a better ability to sort some of that out, but you know, it doesn't mean we're always gonna get it right. These things are always open for interpretation. So the templates that we provided covered just a handful of scenarios originally. And the unique aspect of this was we put these out for consultation and feedback on GitHub, which is, a, as you know, a developer community. We didn't put this on a, a law firm's webpage to get all kinds of lawyers to chime into it, uh, although we do welcome that feedback. 
Um, but we put this into the developer community to see, you know, is this something that's understandable? Do you think this could help you? And we got a lot of important feedback from that. And I think depending on your jurisdiction, there may be certain elements of that that you can pull from more so than others. But I, I think it just comes down to, you know, if you're a startup or a small to medium sized player and you've heard, <laughs> you've heard Jeremy say how cool data sharing is and you've identified a few data sets that you think if you had access to them, you could come out with a great product or service. You know, it's a shame if you have to rely on significant investment into legal advice to sort out exactly what's possible and where liability may hit you. So I think that was just a contribution from our side. I think we'd be supportive of commission efforts in that space. That that does provide a degree of certainty for those who are excited to move quickly there. Um, so yeah, that was a small contribution from our side, but one that we hope to keep building out and collect feedback on. Thank you. Elena, I think you have a question for a very long time now. <laughs> this for a while, let me struggle with my uh, mute button. My question um, actually links back to what you were saying on your COVID-19 and sensor data in the UK. And you mentioned that um, in the excitement for all the outcomes and the results you can get from this work, there was also sensitive data that was um, being shared or that you need to be sensitive of. How was this addressed? Or how are you mindful, let's say, of the types of census data that were being shared? Well, I think in that particular uh, example, we were talking about, you know, city sensors that were placed around the city to collect everything from, you know, weather, traffic data, uh, passenger, not passenger data, but um, what's the right word? Um, pedestrian data, right? Um, so this is not an example of, you know, first of all, we don't have access to, you know, faces and photos of, you know, Eileen walking from one metro stop to another, you know, I think this is all made available in aggregate form. So without access really to that raw data, just talking about aggregate numbers of, you know, this metro stop had this much traffic pre lockdown versus post lockdown. Did we see a change in that pattern from now to there? Did, did weather sensors that were also collecting temperature and moisture data, uh, you know, have any relevance to this space as well? So I, I think anytime you're talking about sensors that are capturing traffic, um, you know, I, I certainly feel more comfortable considering some of that potentially sensitive. Uh, I think in this particular project, we're talking about access to aggregate data um, that again is only accessible. It was the city itself that was conducting this analysis with its research partner and simply using some of the cloud technologies from Microsoft to make those calculations and analysis uh, as quickly as you know, computing can allow much faster than you know, putting our, our eyes and ears to uh, sheets of paper and pouring through that with notes, et cetera. So I think that was mitigated largely through you know, the use of that data consistent with the purposes that the London city um, collected it for in the first place. And again, looking at it in aggregate form. Thank you. I have a slightly follow, uh, slightly, I have a follow up question to that. Have you, how do you solve an, if do you, one, do you come across issues of the quality of data from the different institutions or organizations that you're working with? And how do you work to mitigate this, to as make sure that all the data that is being processed, being shared, being published is open, reaches a level of quality that can be machine readable, that is accessible, and that's actually usable for someone else? No, it's a very, very good question. I think there's, you know, there's good news and bad news on that. Um, if you think of the, the, the London example that I was mentioning, it's important to add that the city also identified certain privately held data sets that they believed could be combined with the data they had to kind of induce some of these learnings. Um, if you think about it in the context of your question, well, that could be great, right? But if it's only available in a particular format, that may take weeks and weeks to um, format in a way that can be used with the way the city is running its applications. I think the good news that I wanted to mention is that some of the technology that's available is able to kind of absorb inputs in whatever format they may be and kind of instantly make that, there, there's, there's more potential now to read raw data in a variety of formats to get the same learnings and outputs from without necessarily having to rely on only a single format or, or a single standard. Um, so that's part of the good news and the excitement. But that only works in certain scenarios, not across the board, and not everyone may have access to those type of technologies. So, you know, our open data message and this data divide that, you know, we think needs to be addressed 
Uh, it's not as simple as just everyone using that latest state-of-the-art technology that disregards formats and can process anything. Not everyone is going to have access to something like that. So standards in that space, very much similarly to the way the commission has highlighted it, not just in specific sectors, but uh, really cross-sectoral. Uh, I think that's one of the perfect starting points where we do make sure that this is not just putting PDFs out there uh, for everyone to uh, pour through, but putting these in the most commonly used machine readable formats. And that gets back a little bit to Gianfranco's message earlier. Um, you can try to get everyone to only use your format and the one that you've invested in, and that may work for a little while, but if you're going to really leverage the collaborative opportunity here, you're gonna to have to either have those technologies that can absorb and take in any formats, or we're gonna to have to agree on common standards that everyone can use, uh, regardless of the type of project they're involved in. So we see standards as an important starting point. There's good news that a lot of work has been done. Standards processes can, of course, take some time. Um, but nonetheless, I think there, there's a lot of reason for optimism on the existing standards, some of the existing formats. And you're going to see that both converge around more common formats and machine readable. I think though, and this is not bad news, but you also see certain sectors that are leveraging this AI opportunity more than ever before who have proprietary formats. You know, they're gonna to wanna to be able to engage in data sharing if they have that mindset shift the same way. But you know, the way that agricultural data is collected and formatted could be very, very, very different than the way that, of course, Jeremy and Aline's data is formatted on one of our personal devices. You know, we've probably never heard of half of those formats, but, you know, combining them together in a way that might produce a new exciting output. Um, the formatting question is an important one. Uh, so, yeah, some work to be done there. Thank you. I think I can pass my baton to John Franco, who also has his hand raised again. Can I make a difficult question, Jeremy? Mm -hmm. you, you work in policy, so you have you have thick skin, right? So, and uh, uh, so the <laughs> I wanted to ask you something that quite straightforward on on. Uh, the relationship between Microsoft and the large uh, digital giants in the US and, and Europe. Uh, we have a forum on the support center for data sharing, which sometimes we, we take our head, our EU head off and we banter a little. And we were arguing about what is really the problem? Why are European citizens concerned in uh, uh, the, the large digital giants being involved in processing data by them? Is it because they are not European, like different perhaps kind of values and culture? Is it because they are too big? So big company, one incident is amplified a lot, or is it a purely matter of perhaps of competition? Uh, can we protect, uh, we, can we ensure a, a good environment for markets when uh, large companies like Microsoft uh, are part of it? Uh, uh, and of course, you, you, you have, you're coming from a certain perspective, but I, I believe it would be very interesting to hear what's your take, because you must be challenged on this every day. Uh, yeah. So please pitch us <laughs> why we should not fear Microsoft. Well, listen, I, I think some of that fear uh, is completely understandable. Um, and let's use another way of describing it. It would be a similar fear that even folks in the US might have about some of these companies having access to the data. And it comes from, I think, a fear of, you know, I'm not sure what they're doing with it. I, I don't have a lot of sight on what's happening behind the scenes. Um, I think some companies, naturally or maybe trusted more than others. Transparency is one way of mitigating that. Um, but rule of law, I mean, at the end of the day, you know, all of this needs to be done legally. And that is the role of policymakers to help instill some of that trust with adherence to the laws and enforcement of those laws. You know, I can think it's totally normal for a citizen when we're talking about big data and we're talking about artificial intelligence and, and what they may or may not have heard about that. Just wondering, well, wait a second, where's my data going? Who has access to it? What are they going to be doing with it? You know, companies have commitments that they can and should make in that space that go beyond their legal requirements. I would encourage anyone uh, considering, you know, what company they may want to work with to, you know, examine that more closely. But I know realistically, you know, not everyone may have time for that. So they rely upon these companies operating legally. And I think that's where policymakers and enforcement authorities have an important role to play. Um, I can appreciate this in the context of competition. I, I know that it comes out often in that space. I think if you see the way that we address it um, with the open data campaign, you know, I, I think we mentioned it head on. I, I think there is a legitimate uh, concern that some of these technologies, particularly artificial intelligence, 
this data is finding itself increasingly concentrated in the hand in the hands of only a few companies or even a couple of countries. And in a data context, you know, the more head start you get there, uh, the harder it is to, you know, kick somebody off the top of that. You can get uh, advantages gained from the amounts of data that you're collecting that come into scale and the like and all the things that emanate from that. So I think we, we mentioned it head on. And I think we look at things like the data sharing opportunity and aspects of our open data campaign as a way of mitigating that, as a way of narrowing that gap. You know, can we contribute data that we've compiled and make that publicly available for anyone to use as an asset towards a new product or service that they may want to create? So whether that's weather data, sustainability data, connectivity data, um, many of our competitors I know release such open data sets as well. Um, you know, encouraging public sector to do the same, which in Europe is largely happening now as the PSI directors implemented. Hopefully this is more public admin, public sector data that's put into the right formats uh, that make it easier for people to combine it with data they may already have. And then there's the role of the technology itself. Sure, there's first party data processing and uh, services that Microsoft's coming out with, but we're providing cloud building blocks that hopefully make it easier for that European player um, to contribute or to develop their own product or service. So I'd like to think that we see it as an opportunity of a bridge. You know, I put it really directly. When I read the European strategy for data, it, it reminded me a lot of what's in our open data campaign. And I think that's a good thing. So I think we've identified the opportunity correctly, but this openness aspect that we're all been discussing, it goes beyond borders. I mean, I, I think a project's gonna be better when you get the best minds and the best data sets into that project. Those data sets and those minds may come from within your borders, from without your borders, uh, but it would be it would be a bit unfortunate to limit the openness and to put a, a line around where the openness starts and ends. The bigger, the better, I would think. But coming back to it's a fair, fair concern. It's one that yes, I, I spent unfortunately I think I spend more time talking about it from that angle sometimes than from the technology side of it. But it's transparency. It's uh, enforcement of existing rules. It's developing new rules to address where gaps may occur there, right? Um, but enforcement, enforcement, enforcement. And yeah, companies themselves have a job to do in terms of developing some of that trust. And there is another point perhaps we can make on this, that is companies have a job to do, but also citizens have their own job. That is perhaps as much energy we put into worrying about the big giants, we may as well take Take the phone up take the phone and make a phone call to our representative in parliament and say guys uh, the law perhaps is not really right or it can be improved or we can do something about it as you say as long as a company move within law we cannot force them to be ethical but we can enforce the law and we, if we don't like the law we change the law we are in a democratic country right exactly and, I, and even if you think about this because i know it comes up in the context of data governance and data transfers often if you think about you know access from law enforcement authorities in third countries you know one of the things that we've done in that space to you know we're going to follow we're going to follow the rules whatever jurisdiction we're operating in and yes this is much bigger than the data sharing story there are different rules in different jurisdictions companies can often find themselves caught in the middle of this where you're forced to either decide to break this country's rule or that country's rule and that's an impossible spot to be in. But in the context of law enforcement and concerns that people may have there, you know, we've committed to challenging and taking governments to court if necessary, uh, any unjust request from law enforcement authorities to customer data that we may be holding. Um, that's something that goes beyond our legal requirements. And it's part of effort. It's just an example of ways that we try to demonstrate to potential customers, hey, listen, we, we understand the trust point here. Um, and also tell us more what we can do to instill that trust, right? So whether it's case studies, whether it's additional commitments and contracts and the like, um, we're going to follow all the laws. And I think we can do more than just simply follow the law and hit that baseline. But companies would be great if companies are competing. And I think they already are, to be honest. I, I, I do look at that more as good news. I think you're going to be more successful if you have answers to all of those questions from a potential customer of like, well, yeah. I'm sure you're GDPR compliant, um, but I'd like to know more about this. I'd like to know more about that. I think you're going to I think you're going to sell more if you have better questions, better answers to those questions, than if you don't. I see a question in chat popping up from Adriano. 
uh, the open data government came basically from governments and big worldwide organizations such as World Bank and the UN. It's clear that data is a key asset for this revolution, but why is it so hard to find this in the private sector? The business perspectives of data sharing, such as data as a service, uh, in between brackets APIs, are pretty amazing too. How Microsoft will position itself in this scenario? How to improve the data sharing market with open data? Innovation can support the data divide gap, so how to improve this innovative environment around data sharing? That's a very, no, I think it's a very good question. Um, I think, you know, I've heard commission officials before say that, you know, we've made member states open up more public sector data. Now we want to see the same from private uh, side of the house. I think what we are doing um, and made some changes internally this year to make this accelerate a bit is we are constantly looking internally at data that our teams may have um, that could potentially be opened up, uh, that could be made available for public access. Uh, sometimes the obstacles you encounter when you identify a particular data set that could be put out there fully open is sure personal data. You know, we're not able to put data out there that was collected on individuals or anything, of course, without anyone's consent. Uh, there can be privacy concerns, there can be trade secret concerns. I think you often in companies you see, you know, the higher value that is placed on a particular data set, naturally, the more reluctance there may be to make that more available, even if that would be the best type of data to make available. So you understandably run into uh, trade secrets, IP concerns, uh, and personal data. Um, we're not going to, as we coming back to Jean Freco's question earlier, you know, as we're trying to develop that trust with customers around the data, their data is their data. It may be hosted or resting on a Microsoft cloud, but this is the customer's data. It's not Microsoft's data. You know, that's not the type of data that we could just open up um, and you know, violate the commitments we've made in that space. But we are, and we have made some personnel changes internally to again, accelerate this, where we have teams now that whose job it is to canvas Microsoft internally and find data sets that we could potentially make available uh, publicly whether we can add that to the catalog of Azure open data sets. I think the collaborations that we're standing up, I mentioned earlier, all of the data that emanates from that will be open by default. And more companies that can lead by example there, the better. Uh, it really just depends sometimes on the type of data specifically that you might have and how valuable that is from a uh, competition perspective that is still the challenge. Um, and again, you wanna make sure there's still an incentive for people to collect this data and develop on top of it. Um, but nonetheless, I think APIs can help address it. You know, it doesn't always have to be open with no restrictions whatsoever. If you can at least provide ways for others to access that data set and maybe mitigate everything that I just mentioned saying, all right, well, we can't share that because it contains personal data. What we can do is share a form of it where you can tap into the aggregate numbers and learn from that and get the same type of value. If you think of, um, I mentioned perhaps earlier, some of the LinkedIn data that we've worked with the World Bank and others to help identify skills gaps and skills demands and job demands. You know, that's not making available to the world everyone's private LinkedIn profile, but it is providing an aggregate tool that you can tap into to see in this country, in this state, there is a gap or a higher demand for this type of skill set, this type of certification than others. Uh, that's a pretty powerful decision making tool. So maybe a simpler way of saying it is if there would be value in trying to come forward with a decision on where should we invest in skills development in our country or in our city? How can we have better informed decision making about investing in the right skills? Sure, you could think that if you just had access to everyone's personal uh, data within LinkedIn, you'd make a better decision. But naturally, that's going to be challenging because that's not what it was collected for in the first place. That you know, that wouldn't be possible. We can make it available in a way, though, where you're only looking at the aggregate numbers and you're still making a pretty informed decision. And you can think about that both in the context of sustainability and other um, topic areas where I think that's where some of the exciting technology is addressing that question a bit better. Whether it's APIs, whether it's uh, homomorphic encryption, or where even certain raw data can be encrypted in a way that creates ciphers where you can then run the computational analysis on essentially simulated data and then use the original key to unlock the calculations for the type of outcomes you may want, i.e. basically preventing any access to the original raw data 
but still powering that more informed decision that you want to come to. I think I have a follow-up question for that myself, um, because, well, a natural question for me would be, what what is the incentive for Microsoft to even publish um, data? Um, because you also risk losing uh, your competitive advantage. So why would you even bother? Well, um, it depends on which format we make it available. I can appreciate the question in the sense of if we were to just take a lot of proprietary data that was collected over the years that our engineers are really excited about coming on, uh, coming out with a new product or service on top of, um, sure. You know, it's, it's, and I think you hear that feedback from companies around Europe that are like, well, wait a second, why would I just, I spent so much investment and time and effort collecting this. Um, why would I just make it available for anyone else to use? And in some situations, the answer would be, well, yeah, you probably wouldn't. Um, but in other instances, you can say, because if you make it available with certain conditions and in certain ways, it doesn't always have to be just making it available on a publicly available website, but making it available via an API or, and again, some companies will be making this available with monetary, um, uh, requirements, right? You know, you can, you can certainly purchase access to some of this. Um, I think making it available does again, coming back to that point about making it available publicly, you can certainly make it available to a particular project or collaboration that you're working on where then everyone gets certain value out of it because you're contributing that so that it, so that it adds to data that's going to be created that then Microsoft could also use, you know, so if we have a particular data set, sure, it may be valuable. But it could be what could be more valuable is the combination of that data set with another privately held data set that then comes out with outcomes uh, and results that's even more valuable. Now we have something better than the original asset. We have a new asset. So, you know, we're not naive about this space, and I, I don't think any of our customers are, are naive about that. I don't think everyone's just racing to make data donations in that in that sense. But at the same time, um, where we can make some of this available without any um, where we can make some of this available open, it sets the right example. There are data sets that maybe we're not monetizing the way that we planned. I, I do want to say though that one of the challenges, especially when we're talking about it in the context of personal data is, you know, there, there's still the purpose limitation principle here. It's really hard for us to make available any personal data that wasn't collected for that purpose in the first place. Um, but if we put the personal data aside, and we're just looking at it from like the industrial data side of things, I think, you can certainly make it available in different contexts, to different players for different purposes where you're still being open, more open than before. And that's a good thing um, without necessarily going all the way to that end of the spectrum that you have to make it available for everyone and anyone to use in any way they want. And then you've just, you know, almost taken yourself out of the process. Thank you. Um, and then tying into that, how do you see um, these developments going forward? Um, so say, um, I don't know, 10 years from now, uh, are we going to open up more and more APIs? Um, are we going to make stuff more available? Um, how do you envision the future in that? I think we're certainly optimistic about that. And I, I like the fact that you asked it in 10 years um, because, you know, this open data campaign um, is one that we do see as a long-term project. You know, we want to look at that and and basically develop that plan by saying, okay, let's think about what we would talk about 10 years from now. Uh, what would success look like? You know, I mean, how much more openness would be there for us to say, okay, we've seen this mindset shift. We, we, we've seen it. Uh, I think we're certainly optimistic and I think we're optimistic because of some of the technology that is possible. I think we're often looking at this very much in the context of artificial intelligence. And so when you start to see, you know, more successful applications and services emerge there and the, and the scramble that people will have to want to use AI to help improve their product, their service, their team, their organization, um, you're going to see higher and higher demands for the data that needs to basically run and inform and populate those type of algorithms and those type of products and services. And people are going to quickly realize uh, they don't have enough data on their own to do that, right? So you're going to have to find a way to do it. And I think everybody always wants access to the other entities data. Uh, it's hard to get access from people give up the access. But I think when people see that it's going to have to be a give and take, hopefully that will help affect some of that mindset shift. And once they've done it a few times and realize that, wait, I'm actually more successful now than I was before when I was withholding 
I, I survived, everything was okay. And actually now I have a better relationship with that player and that partner and that collaboration. Um, and we're really learning and moving forward with that. That's kind of the mindset shift that takes time. But I think uh, in 10 years, we're optimistic that you'll, you'll see it. Nice, good to hear. And then one thing from my side, um, you mentioned that um, a reluctancy to share data is often funded in, well, often stems from competition advantages that you might lose. Um, is there anything else that obstructs it? Yeah, I think um, there's sometimes still uncertainty around intellectual property in that context. There's uh, certainly a lot of uncertainty and um, fear from a personal data side of things. You know, if this was data that was collected for one purpose, how can I make that available to others who may have different purposes than what the original individual or data subject had in mind? Uh, IP and copyright come up quite a bit. I think we were very happy to see what we believe is very much the right approach that the European Commission took in the context of the copyright directive with the text and data mining exception, where you really do encourage the type of data analytics and computational analysis that's possible now because of these new technological tools, you encourage that for non-consumptive use, if you will, while still allowing rights owners to maintain uh, the possibility to reserve those rights if they would prefer to only make that available via licensing or what have you. But if there is publicly, data, publicly available data that you or I could potentially sift through and extract learnings and, and bits of information from for a completely different non-consumptive use, we have a more clarity now around our ability to do that without running into a potential injunction or takedown requirement from a rights owner finding ourselves in court. So that really relates to the text and data mining space. But competition concerns come up. I think um, privacy, IP, trade secrets. Um, and you know what? Even there are some that, getting back to Gianfranco's question, sometimes people are like, well, I don't want to share. That may only make this company bigger. That may only reinforce some of those advantages. So there can be a number of reasons. Uh, one of which I think I forgot to mention is sometimes people just don't know how. You know, they say, "Listen, I, I would love to, you know, even share my data or make it available, or maybe even be compensated for it, but I just don't know how to go about doing that. Uh, what does that mean? Do I just save it all in a PDF and put it on a website somewhere? I mean, that doesn't seem that seems a bit primitive. Um, how can I do that in a way where I want this community? to have access to it, but I'm concerned if it falls into the hands of this other community, you know, how can I make, how can I be more open to make sure that the researchers I have a great relationship with or the health community that I've been working with can tap into that, but I do so in a way that doesn't allow some of the more nefarious characters to maybe have access to it. So some of that is just familiarity that needs to be gained around the possibility to use different tools. Uh, so there's really a variety of questions I often kind of I think that's a good way to look at what this open data campaign is about. If you look at the reasons people provide for being reluctant to share data, let's start going down the list one by one and see if technology, if policy, if legal changes or simply cultural mindset shifts need to be prioritized in order to better answer those questions. Thank you. And in mind of time, um, I would like to ask the audience if there's any more question, please um, feel free to do so now. We have time for one last question. If nothing else, uh, then Jeremy, I would like to ask you if you could hang in uh, for five minutes longer so that we can debrief. And then to the audience, if you could fill out the satisfaction survey, that would be very nice. That would help us out a great deal. And Jeremy, I thank you for presenting today. Oh, thank you. I could talk about this for a while, so I appreciate that. Thank you very much.